Romans uh, chapter 8, as we continue through this letter from Paul to those in Rome, the church in Rome. It's good to remember that this is a, um, a letter written to believers. And I'll begin reading in verse 26. We're just looking at verses 26 and 27. Before we go to the Lord of the Word, before we go to the Word of the Lord, let us go to the Lord of the Word. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your Word. We thank you that it comes to us. Um, without error, that your spirit speaks directly to our spirit from your word. So we pray that we would not hear this as a non-believer would, just academically and thinking, you know, it just sounds nice, but that um, you have worked in our hearts. And there are those who hear this, and um, you even work faith through your word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So we pray that you would bring people to faith, even through this, and that you would strengthen um, the faith of those who are here, who believe in you and are trusting in you alone for our salvation. And we pray this for your, your holy unction for the hearing and preaching of your word. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The word of the Lord. So it's kind of interesting if I were going to pick a, a sermon for the new year and do one of those types of sermons. I think this is a good one, because um, you know, what a lot of churches do or like, um, this is the year of something. You know, this, this year we're going to do this. This year we're going to do that. This year we're going to focus on this. And this year we're going to do, you know, because this year is going to be different than last year. Because, you know, and that sort of thing. This year will be different than last year because it's a different year. It's just everything changes. It's one of the things about our life. And so this year we're going to focus on the gospel, which is what we've trying to be been focusing on. Hopefully, this year we'll we'll get closer to getting it right. We'll 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 be digging into the Word of God, and and as God brings us closer and closer to Himself through His Word, strengthening our faith, our relationships with one another, all of these things as we continue and from one week to the next in all of our lives to grow deeper in our relationship and our knowledge and confidence and faith in the Lord. Now, if, if, if there are churches, somebody's listening to this or you're visiting or something and your church is doing, you know, this is the year of whatever, um, fine. It's, it, you, we realize what people are trying to do. We're trying to, as pastors, as church leaders, we want people to, to get uh, reinvigorated. We want people to say, you know, I'm going to, this year, you know, I'm going to take off charging forward. And, and, and there's good ways and bad ways to, to look at this. And a, a bad way to do that is in our own power, in our own strength. That we're going, we are going to do better this year. I will try harder. I will do better. I will. It's like, well, good. You know, hopefully you will. But one of the things that hopefully you'll learn the harder you try with this is, I really need Christ. I need him more than I thought. So the harder you try to do better, the more you hopefully will realize I really need Christ. I need more faith. I need his spirit. I need to be in his word. I need to try harder. I need to work. Hard. And there we go again. And so we need to be in his word. And the only reason you're going to go into his word for the right reasons is because the Holy Spirit is motivating you to go into his word. So how do we get more of the Holy Spirit? You pray for more of the Holy Spirit. So is that a work? Is prayer a work? Yeah, it's a work. But it's a work motivated by the Holy Spirit. So there's, we can do all of these things in our life in the flesh. And we can do all these things in our life in the spirit. And in this life, we're just kind of always struggling there. And the, in this passage, Paul begins, inspired by the Holy Spirit, by saying, likewise. So you see that word. So it's like if you just came in and you've never read Romans before and you see likewise, you're like, gosh, I should. I need to go back and watch all the DVDs and catch up on what's going on here. But it's OK. We can do this because it's like likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness. So we're going to look at the likewise just a second. So if you go back to 
uh, just verse 16 in chapter 8. He says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So Paul is talking to the, the believers in Rome. And he starts off at the beginning and just saying, you know, we're, we're all sinners. We, we need Christ. And he starts talking about the gospel and justification and who we are in Christ. And, and then he starts to talk about this encouragement that we have by the Holy Spirit. Like, so, yes, we struggle. And so Romans 7, he's saying, I do the things I don't want to do. I can't do the things I want to do. And he's like, you know, just in my flesh, if I'm just trying to do these things on my own, as he had very proudly done in the law in the past, and then when the Holy Spirit comes and says, you want to really take a look at the law? The law will undo you. You've, you, you are not to base all of your standing success on how good you do, but you're to do all your standing and success based on how all that Christ has done for you. And that's why he can then say, I'm the chief of sinners, rather than I'm a chief of the righteous. So that's where Paul's transition goes from I am the best to I am the worst. And therefore, Christ is the best and the strongest, and he will raise me up, and I am in him, and he is in me, and he is all in all. And that's what we're preaching, not ourselves, but Christ Jesus. And so he says, the Holy Spirit is helping in this. In verse 16, the Spirit himself is bearing witness with our spirit that we're children of God. And that's encouraging. Hopefully that's encouraging to you. If you, you go through life, you, you can go through this life and, and um, you, you know, through the mud, the muck, the mire, uh, tripping up, falling down, doing things you shouldn't do, and then you can just go, hey, I'm doing all right, though. You know, I'm just... I just one of my favorite memes is everything's burning down. That little cartoon dog is sitting there just drinking coffee. You know, it's all good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And you're just like telling yourself about the same thing. Your life is, you can see where it's falling apart, but you're like, hey, everything's fine. But what the Holy Spirit is saying is like, listen, you're a mess. <laughs> I mean, the Holy Spirit will come into your life and just say, you know, David's praying, you know, or in the Psalms, it's like, show me you know, my inward thoughts, you know, lead me to the ways everlasting. Well, if you want to be led in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, that means you're going to have to become aware that the paths you're currently walking are not all righteous. And that's going to lead you to discouragement and despair and tragedy and to work harder and try all these things because that's what the flesh and the world and Satan are going to tell you to do. Look how awful you are. God can't love you. Holy Spirit's like, I love you. Believer, not the whole world, so you must be in Christ. <laughs> this is one of the things we, we have to come to terms with and we have to be preaching to the world is you need Christ. Well, apart from Christ, you are hell-bent. That's it. There, there, your, your mind, the world, the flesh, Satan will all teach you to believe that, oh my goodness, you're lovable, you're awesome, you're great. God, a loving God would never send people like you to hell. It's like, you don't know the holiness of God. The holiness of God. And so we do preach Jesus Christ, him crucified for our sins, so that whosoever would believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Father draws them by the word, and whoever comes to Christ, he will by no means cast out. So we have this great hope and this confidence in Christ. And then as a believer, you then have the Holy Spirit as you become more and more convicted of the fact that there are problems in my life. I am not good enough. I am not doing well enough. Why is this happening? Why is that happening? All these things. Well, the Holy Spirit is within us going, you need to cry, Abba, Father. You need to cry to your Father. You have the Spirit within us saying, you're adopted. You're my child. You're my son. I do love you. Is there discipline? Yes, there's discipline. But it's not treating you as your sin deserves. It is treating you in loving kindness and goodness. So when we... Um, our children misbehave and we do something to discipline them. The Bible even says no discipline seems uh, good at the time, but it leads us into a fruit of righteousness, which leads to peace. And so what we have to do is, is the Lord comes to us and he has things that come into our lives that calls us to pray differently, to read the Bible differently, to, to, to look at ourselves differently and all of these things. But the Holy Spirit is within ourselves the help that he says there is in verse 16 is him bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, fellow heirs of Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may be 
glorified with him. And then he, if you says some other things about creation and stuff like this, you know, the suffering, verse 18, suffering is this present time not worth uh, comparing with the glory that's to be revealed to us. So he's encouraging us and letting us know, you know, don't stay focused just on this storm. There's better coming. There's, there's purpose for all this and there's glory. But then he says, likewise, not only is the spirit within us, saying, you are children of God, the spirit of adoption is within us. But likewise, the Spirit's also helping us in our weakness. And this word helping is important because you can say, you know, just the word help is good. But the word actually means, it's this long Greek word with all these little different prefixes and stuff add to it. But what it means is, the image that comes into my mind, if I try to think in pictures, is tug of war. And so, you know, you've got your enemies over here, and they're trying to pull you into the you know, the pit or whatever it is, they're trying to pull it, the mud, and you're, you're pulling and you're doing the best you can. Well, you're weak. You can't do this. Well, the Holy Spirit, if this word for help means that someone else comes and they assist in the pulling, or it can also mean assist in the pushing, but they come and assist you in achieving a goal. That's what the word help means here. So the Holy Spirit uh, helps us get somewhere helps us to achieve something. The Holy Spirit is assisting us to do something. So the word help can kind of just be, there's lots of kinds of help. And there's only one other place in the New Testament where this word's used, and it's when uh, Jesus is at the home of Martha, Martha and Mary, and Mary is at the feet of Jesus, just listening to you know, the Lord of salvation teach. And Martha's in there trying to clean up everything. And uh, Martha comes in and rebukes Jesus. You know, why, tell her to come and help me. Same word. Tell her to come and assist me to accomplish the thing that I'm trying to accomplish. And Jesus says, you're worried about a great many things. Mary has chosen the better. And so I remember being in a church years ago, different church, in a different place completely. And uh, the women in the church were a little upset with Jesus because he ought to be telling them to her to go help clean up in the kitchen. That was wrong of him. <laughs> I remember thinking, wait a second. You, you, you have to be looking at this wrong. But you know, obviously these women were a little upset because they didn't feel as if people were helping them um, in their work. And they're like, I know what it means. I know what Martha means. I know what this is like. You know, you in there having fun. I'm in here having to clean up. And so one of the things we're going to try to do on Wednesday nights when we teach is like we're going to cut out as much cleaning up as possible so that people don't get distracted by the cleaning up. So, um, but what we're looking at is if you think about how Martha felt incorrectly, she should have been in there. It's like, everything's okay. Your house, you, you know, Jesus shows up. I, the, one of the jokes is all, you know, here comes, you know, the preachers come and hide the beer. You know, stuff like that. It's like, you know, preachers, come, uh-oh, we got we to gotta clean up everything because you can't let him see it. And then what Martha's like, you know, we can't let Jesus see that we have a mess in our house. It's like, <laughs> Jesus is fine with the mess. He wants you. And so, but if you think about the help that Martha wanted to accomplish these things, we have a weakness where we can't do the things that we want to do, and the Holy Spirit is that helper. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to help Martha think rightly. The Holy Spirit is the one that's going to help us get the things done that we want to get done. And so the next thing he says, well, let me just say this too about, about this weakness thing. He helps in our weakness. He doesn't say he helps those who are weak. God bless you. I know some of y'all are still weak. You know, one day when you're strong, you won't need all this. But it doesn't say that. He's like, as a believer, you have weakness. It's just the way it is. You, you have weakness. And one of the ways that he shows that we have this weakness is like, we don't even know what to pray for as we all. And so if you think about your weakness just in prayer, there's lots of things. We don't know how to pray. How's it worded here? Um, we do not know what to pray for as we ought. It can also be translated, we don't know how to pray as we ought. So is it like, we don't get prayer. I mean, we get it a lot because Scripture tells us about prayer. But if you really think and you've been a Christian for long, you know that many times, really almost most times, you're not exactly sure how to pray. But you're not completely without it because you have the word of God. So you pray the word of God back to him. You know, thy will be done. I mean, that's one. I mean, you know you can pray that and the Holy Spirit's got you on that one. We're not weak when it comes to that. So then, you know, then James comes along and says, hey, you know, you don't have certain things because you haven't asked. 
And then when you do ask, you just ask to spend on sinful desires. And you're like, well, how do I know the difference between my sinful desires and my godly desires? I know what to, how do I know what to ask for? And it's like, well, a lot of times you are asking for your sinful desires. You don't realize it. Or you're always, you know, if somebody's sick, what do we pray for? Healing. Bless you. Healing. That was a cough. You don't get blessed for a cough. You don't get blessed for sneezes. My mistake. So you pray for healing. But is it God's will for everyone to be healed? No. So how do you know when you're praying according to God's will and not? Well, you know, we're supposed to pray. What we are praying for is for the curse to be reversed completely. We want new heavens and new earth. We, you know, what do we want? You know, we want new heavens and new earth. When we want it, we want it now. We don't have it now. You're living in the cursed and fallen world. So if we pray things like, please save every single person in the entire world always, it's like that's not according to his word. If we pray, please help me as I'm trying to um, figure out a way to rob this bank. No, <laughs> that's not according to his word. Uh, please help me not to get caught in adultery. It's like, oh, wait a second. You know, it's like you know, all these things that we can pray for sinful things. You know, it's like, well, that's not right. But if you think about it, how do we know that certain things are right to pray for and certain things are wrong to pray for as believers? And we know that because of his word. So, as believers, what makes us, are we believers because we believe his word, or do we believe his word because we're believers? And it's like, yeah, it's kind of both, but the reason you're believers is because the Holy Spirit's working in your life. This is the word of the Holy Spirit, inspired through men, theonoustos, God breathed. So, the Holy Spirit has given us his word. And as a believer, you believe it more and more, you understand it more and more. So, when you're praying his word, that's the Holy Spirit within you. Praying to the Father. But even when you pray the word of God to God the Father, you're not always exactly sure if I'm applying it properly. Am I approaching God properly? Am I, you know, what, what is this thing with this prayer that I'm doing? And so what we're seeing here is with the Spirit helping us, because one of the things is like just not knowing how to pray, um, is that he is within us, doing two things. One is he's teaching us how to pray. He's in our hearts. He's, he's, he's taking a desire that we have, like maybe you have a desire to be loved. Okay, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be loved, but there can be bad ways to want to be loved. You know, you know, somebody can want to be loved or somebody can want to be worshipped. Somebody can want to be, and it gets to be like this, and they're a believer. So the Holy Spirit is, is working with our spirits, and you know, they might be praying, please help these people to treat me better. And it's like, and you know, God the Father could, you know, and just personify it a little bit. God the Father could easily be up there going, you, I can't believe they're treating you as good as, you, as, you, as they are now. What do you mean you want them to treat you better? They're treating you better than you possibly deserve. If they treat you better, things are going to go really bad for you. You know, you don't know what, what this is. So you're, you're praying for people to love you more. So the Holy Spirit is within us. And what he does is gradually over time, he's working in our hearts. So hopefully our prayers begin to change. So that they become more aligned with the mind of God. But then the other thing that happens is the Holy Spirit is in our hearts and he, and he, he knows what it is we're really wanting. Like we don't even know what we really want. But God knows what we want even before we ask. So we're going to touch in just a minute about then why even pray. Because part of this would be what well, the Holy Spirit's praying for me. I can just sit back and not do anything. You know, and later in Romans, he even says, Jesus is praying for us at the right hand of God, praying intercessory prayers for us. So you have the Holy Spirit praying. So the Holy Spirit understands the groanings in our hearts. And they kept using this word groaning in, in, in chapter 8, this groaning, this, this um, I mean, we all know what groaning is. And so is it, when you, you read this, is this the Holy Spirit who's groaning? And they put, some of the translations had this too deep for word, where the word too deep is not in the, original language, it means groanings without words. Groanings, and that can either, it either means, <laughs> this is groanings that can't be put into words, or it's groanings that are not put into words. But either way, these groanings are not articulated in our language. They're just presented. You know what it means. Just I mean, if you've ever had times of deep distress when you've prayed, you know that in times of whatever your emotion is, whether it's exuberation, boy, that didn't sound like a real word, or 
tremendous sorrow and mourning and sadness, there's times when you just can't. How am I supposed to put this in words? You just, and the spirit within us gets that. And it's either he takes and feels and hears our groanings and presents them to God. And you think about what language is. Language is something we use to try to get something from our mind to your mind so that we can understand, you know, what happened. You know, we can, we can, we, we can commune with one another with language. The Holy Spirit doesn't need that. God doesn't need this articulation of, of language. He just knows. And so he's connected to our groanings and he presents in a holy way, these desires that we have, and we're praying in all kinds of ways, but the Holy Spirit is one teaching us how to pray properly, but also purifying and perfecting our prayers so they go to God the Father and they're answered perfectly for us. So it's like if, if God answered perfectly every single prayer, if you've lived long enough, you're very thankful that God has not answered every single prayer you've ever prayed in exactly how you prayed it. I mean, one, we pray contradictory things all the time. Uh, another, we pray for things that we, looking back, it's like, whoo, thank you for not answering that prayer. You know, or I'm glad I didn't get that house. I'm glad I didn't get that job. I'm glad I didn't this, this, this. You know, things that you thought you desperately wanted, desperately needed. And then over time, you're able to look back and you're like, wow, that house had a bad problem. You know, wow, that job <laughs> had a bad problem. I never would have been here if I'd have done that. You know, we look at where the house that we bought. When we were moving here, if you've ever, you know, where you live, that's a huge decision. <laughs> where, because so many things in your life are going to be impacted just by which house you buy. And how are we supposed to get things like that right? You know, so you, how do we pray? You don't even know how to pray. Find, help me find a house that has a good, a great neighborhood. You know, help me find a house. And so the Holy Spirit hears these things. He's like, you have the spirit of adoption. You have the Father and knows exactly what you really want. And he also knows what you really need. And he knows how to give it to you better than you could ever imagine. And so you come to this idea. You just have to be comforted by that. This is the first thing that, that God's telling us with this is you are his child. And he's not just like we are parents and a child comes to us. And they'll start asking you for something. And I notice sometimes it takes a few minutes to figure out, slow down. What are you asking me? I mean, a lot of it is like, I don't even understand what you want. Do you know what you want? <laughs> you know, it's like you have this whole thing. It's human um, parent-child relationship. But with God the Father, it's like he knows what we want, what we need before we get there. And he tells us to ask. Because in that is our relationship to him. So as we grow in our relationship to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do so by listening at his feet in his word, by trying to, to do what he says out of love and a desire that's placed in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to actually do these things, and then seeing more and more our weakness, seeing more and more of these frailties, and understanding more and more the gospel, our need for Christ, and what the Holy Spirit truly is at work, what he does within us. So just a couple places Romans 5, 5 says that his love is poured into our hearts and the Holy Spirit is given to us. So you've got his love poured into our hearts. So as we pray, you know, I mean, when I was little and somebody would hurt me or I'd be angry at somebody, I'm like, make him have a wreck on his bike. Make him fall down, you know, just crying. It's like, I am angry. You know, it's like, so it's like, well, hopefully his love is going to be poured into our hearts as we grow. So you're like, Help me not to be so angry and vengeful. Help me to absorb some blows. Help that person to do better. And then you can't help but, you know, and also help that person to figure out how wrong they are. You know, so you're just going on with this. But the Holy Spirit is within us. It's like, I got this. But you need to pray. And you need to watch. And you need to see. And you need to think. And we have his love poured into our hearts. And he is within us. All right, so just real quickly, if you look at Ephesians chapter 3, so just get, if you know how to find these things and see who gets there first. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly, okay, speaking of God, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think. So he can do far more abundantly, anything we're even asking for, even any more than, than we think, according to the power at work within us. 
Then it says, to him be the glory in the church and Jesus Christ through all generations forever and ever. Amen. But according to the power at work within us. You have, believer, a power at work within you. And it's not your power. It is the Holy Spirit's power at work within you through the gospel, through his word, and through prayer as a means of grace. And so he is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. And I just part of what I'm being convicted of as I'm studying this passage and thinking about it is we need to be asking. And so it's like, well, for what do we ask? What am I supposed to ask for? It's like, well, pray the promises of God back to him and then just start asking for whatever it is you think you want and go to his word and keep praying for it. Share it with other believers. And then you'll begin to see the Holy Spirit working within you and saying, maybe you ought not to be thinking about it like this exactly. Maybe you're praying a little bit like this. But James is like, he does have, you don't have because you don't ask. So that God in this world, in this life, uses our prayers to accomplish things. We need to pray more. And you have the Holy Spirit within us prompting prayers. So it doesn't mean every prayer we have is inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul prayed three times that this thorn be removed from me. And the answer came back, you know, uh, my grace is sufficient for you. So it's like, did Paul lack faith? Did Paul not have the Holy Spirit? Paul had all these things, and yet he prayed three times. It wasn't anything wrong with his prayer. He was just not praying according to the will of God. However, he was praying according to the will of God because he was praying for the thorn to be removed. You should pray for that thorn to be removed. It's a bad thing in your life. You don't like it? Pray to get rid of it. Oh, and then in the meantime, thank you for the thorn. Thank you that your grace is sufficient. We've been taught this through Paul's prayer by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And what the Holy Spirit has to do is in the midst of our thorns and our flesh, and we're praying about it, and we're like, <clears throat> groans. And they add that too deep for words thing, which is very poetic in its sound. It's just wordless groans. And there are times in my life when I've just prayed, help. And I don't have that big, long Greek word in my mind. Just help. By whatever, just do something. Help. And I think those are my most powerful prayers. Just, I don't know what to do. I give up. And when I say give up, I give up trying to untangle this knot myself. I need you. But what God doesn't do is say, don't worry, you go lay down, take a nap, I'll take care of it. He's like, all right. You ready for this? <laughs> no, I am not ready for this. No, you're not. We're going to get you there. The table, the gospel. You need his word to get you from one step to the next when these storms are here. And in Ephesians 6, 17, so if you're still there, Ephesians 6, verse 17 says, it's, it's in the, the armor of God, taking up the armor, the helmet of salvation, these things, and the sword of the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So you have the Word of God, and it's a sword. It's defense and it's offense, but it is a weapon, and it is something we're supposed to be using. The Word of God, and too many Christians want to have the Holy Spirit apart from the Word of God. <laughs> the Word of God is inspired by the Holy Spirit. You want to hear the Holy Spirit speak directly to you? Read the Bible. Then how do I apply it? So <laughs> it's nice to be able to have the Holy Spirit speak directly words to you and tell you exactly what to do and when to do it, but that's not the way the Bible tells us to approach him. And so, and we see that right here. The word of God, sword of spirit. Then what do we do? Pray at all times in the spirit. So that settles it. R.C. Sproul has a little story he tells. He's in a seminary class, and um, I think it's can't think of his teacher's name, but he's up there and he's talking and he's saying, um, well, if God already knows, if God's in control of everything, why pray? And so he goes around to each student and asking them and they're coming up with these reasons and Sproul says, I'm sitting, Gerstner is the teacher's name, <clears throat> Sproul says, I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, he's going to come to me, I got nothing. <laughs> he finally, he says, I don't know, he says, uh, baby, because the Bible says we should pray. And Gerstner says, that's right, Mr. Sproul. It's such a small reason to God, the Lord of the universe, tells us to pray. Therefore, maybe it is incumbent upon us that we should pray. And so, good, thank you. I got that one right, I guess. <laughs> you know, so it's like, why do we pray? You're told to pray. Even if you can't figure out why. You don't know how the sovereignty of God and my prayers, how's all that work together? I can't figure it out. Okay, so what are you going to do? Sit there and do nothing? That's like your child. You say, take out. I'm sorry, you know, we have a couple grandkids staying with us for a little bit, so 
you don't hear a lot of parent-child things. Our children are perfect. I just have noticed how bad other kids are by observing how good ours are. So, you know, if, when other parents tell their kids, you know, do this thing, take out the garbage. You know, our kids are immediately like, yes, sir, is there more things that I might take out? And I'm like, no, you're good, just do this for right now. But other kids are like, I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's like, okay, gosh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> you can empathize. The spirit, here's my groaning. So I'll just go back to where I was. We're praying at all times in the spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel. And so what he is saying here is that we're to pray at all times because you're told to do it. That's where, and he would come back. You're told to do it. So if you're told to pray, but you can't figure out why to pray, and you're not going to obey until you can agree that this is a thing I ought to do, then you're in a bad situation. Do what you're told to do, whether you feel like it or not, and pray for the feelings and understanding to come later. But obedience is just do it. So that's one of the things we've tried to say. You can argue about this after you do it, we'll talk about next time, not this time, because you're just trying to get out of it. We don't want to pray. I can tell you, we have a prayer meeting. We go from 80% attendance to 5% attendance because prayer sounds weird. Prayer sounds, I would say it even might sound girly, but women don't show up for it either any more than men, sometimes more men, sometimes more women, but it's like we don't... <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean to channel Darth Vader. He is on the dark side. Don't understand the power of prayer. We don't understand the power of prayer. The Holy Spirit prompting our prayers, groaning. He wants us to pray, and we're supposed to pray at all times. Paul is even saying, and I need for you to pray for me that words from the Holy Spirit might be given. It's like, we need the Holy Spirit. How do you get the Holy Spirit help? You pray. How do you pray? The Holy Spirit's helping you pray. You pray in the Spirit, not in the flesh. How do you do that? You just live with him in his word with believers. You take communion. You think about what's happening there. You see baptism taking place. You preach the gospel to yourself. You pray at all times for all things with thanksgiving so that the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I mean, that's, that's the word of God. You pray that to Jesus. Help me to pray at all times for all things with thanksgiving. Help me to be more thankful. That my heart will be guarded. Guard my heart. Guard my mind. So that I can have a peace. Because it's going to surpass all our understanding. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. So that's like, you know, pretty straightforward. Luke 18.1, You ought always to pray and not lose heart. That's, oh, that's a good one. You ought always to pray. Not lose heart. Because it's easy to lose heart. And, and one of the first things that can happen is you stop praying. Because it's just too much. And that, I do think, is the Holy Spirit is still there praying for us with these groanings. And whether it's our groanings or the Holy Spirit groaning, it's, he is intimately a part of us, which is what happens in, in the second verse in Romans 8. He just says <clears throat> in 27, He who searches hearts. So this is Old Testament thinking. God the Father, he searches heart. He knows what's in your heart. Okay, He doesn't know just what's in your head or something. He knows what's in your heart. So he searches hearts, and he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. And so there's a debate over that, whether it's talking about our spirit or the Holy Spirit. But either way, what he's saying is he searches the hearts, and he knows what's the mind of the Spirit. He knows what we're thinking, and he certainly knows what he's thinking. And this God is dwelling within us because the Spirit intercedes, and that means you know we're not exactly, we're heading in one direction and we're doing something, and somebody something's about to you know somebody's angry and they're about to do something, and the Spirit comes along and says, whoa, 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 just be, don't don't do that. And so when Jesus is praying intercessions for us, it's like Satan would love to have his hands on us because he's got enough material to work with, and Christ is like, no, Father, let my blood sufficient 
grace, 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 grace. And so he's praying grace for us. The Spirit is interceding for the saints. Now, in the Roman Catholic Church, there are certain people who teach that we pray for saints to intercede for us. That's wrong. Very wrong-headed. Don't, don't, don't do that. Don't pray for people who've gone before us to pray for us. Um, pray for God, to God, and that God would help us. That interceding for the saints, it means the holy ones. That's us, believers. Paul refers to every single believing person as the hagios, glory, I mean, uh, holy ones, set apart for his purpose. So the Spirit is interceding for believers according to the will of God. And so anything you ask, anything you ask God, and then he adds, according to his will, he will do it. It's like, well, yeah, how do I know? Well, that's the work of the Christian and the believer. But this is what you have going for you. God is praying for us, and he's answering the prayers for us. God is for us, and if God is for us, then nobody can be against us. 1 John 5, 14 says this, This is the confidence we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And I want to close with Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, which says this, Do not be anxious for anything. Now again, there is a thing called anxiety that people feel, and they and some of that's just physical, and you got to learn how to deal with that and stuff. But this anxiety is this mental thing about, oh no, what's going to happen if this doesn't happen? Oh no, it's just worry, 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 worry that things are spinning out of control. Be anxious about don't do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplications, two word and thanksgivings, three different types of prayers, just praying, just talking to God. Uh, Asking him to supply things, help me with this, supplication. And then Thanksgiving is just, he always adds his Thanksgiving. And um, I think it's a, it's a reason for it because we can become victims. It's like I've got, all these things are against me. Well, what are you thankful for? And when you start to see what you're thankful for, it's like, I'm thankful that I have anything. I mean, you had to really get down to the fact that you have anything at all is the grace of God. You've, you've got to get that grace of God. It's the grace of God. Not because I did better. I mean, maybe you did work hard. Maybe you did go to school. Maybe you did do these things to you. And good. But why you and not somebody else? So many things. Grace of God. Grace of God. Thank you for allowing me to go to school. Thank you for helping me to, to work hard. I, I don't know why I did it and not somebody else. I don't know why I didn't do better. Just thank you. Thanksgiving is always something. And then let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, and that's good, because a lot of times somebody's like, why are you, I have no reason to be at peace. Well, I don't know, so why are you so peaceful? I don't know. <laughs> because God says the peace of God surpasses all understanding will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. And so we have to be prayerful. We, have to, we need to be more committed to prayer. We need to be sensitive to the Spirit's leading, to pray in the Spirit. And this cannot be done apart from His Word, which is the sword of the Spirit. Prayer is given to us as an instrument. We've been given instructions on how to pray. His word tells us that he's our helper. And he's striving with us, helping us. And so it's very difficult to say, how do we do these things without doing them in our own power? Well, I would say probably the answer to that is, Work as hard as you humanly can possibly at trying to do it under your own power. And it won't take long before you give up and you can say, okay, help. You know, you've not yet resisted sin to the point of bloodshed. It's like, okay, yeah, I give in way too easily. I give up with prayer way too easily. And I'm trying to guilt people into praying. You know, I say we have prayer meeting and not many people show up. And I don't want everybody to start showing up because, oh, well, I better show up. It looks bad. No, I'm just saying it's how we think about prayer. I think about it too. Prayer meeting doesn't sound as good as a buffet or something. You know, it's like, what, what are we going to do? You're going to make me pray out loud? You know, and there's an embarrassment about public speaking and things. But for God's people to, to come together around his word and just say, let's just pray. And even if you don't pray out loud, to, to pray corporately as a body um, is something we're, we're told to do, which is why a part of our worship service is in prayer. So, um, Pray, begin with the Lord's Prayer. Memorize it. 
It's a good little thing to do. You get the word of God within you. And then it's been amazing to me over the years from just saying it in church and having it memorized, praying for somebody else. Um, I remember one person had done me wrong and I was very angry about it. And I just, and I was praying the Lord's prayer in my head before I go to sleep at night, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive. I was like, ah, okay, help me to forgive this person. It's change the prayer because that's the Holy Spirit at work within us. And that's what we're called to do. So, that being the case, let us pray. Father God, we're terrible at praying. We, we don't do it enough. We don't believe in it enough. We don't love talking to you enough. We don't, we're not in your word enough. <laughs> um, but you're sufficient. You are enough. So help us to be able to rest knowing that where we fall short, which is way shorter than we think, you, you're there with us as believers. And for those who are not in you, who don't know you, Lord, I pray they'd see their great need of a Savior, turn to you, and then know what a relationship with you is like to actually hear you speak directly to us in your word and in prayer, in the Lord's Supper, in communion with other believers. Lord, we pray that you would help us to just ask because we want to. And then to know that you've told us to, that we're not wrong to, and that we actually are being obedient children when we bring our every request to you. And we're thankful because we need the peace of God. We need your peace. And we're thankful for it. Help us to be more thankful. We pray this in Christ's holy name. Amen.